of the latest major events in European politics have had a twofold implication. Wherever the challenges grew, the potential for a progressive European civil society also became visible. From austerity politics to free trade negotiations, from the refugee movement to Brexit, from nationalist governments to the rise of far-right movements, in all these cases, European citizens organized themselves and stood up for a Europe of openness, tolerance and solidarity. But despite these signs of hope, the overall political situation undoubtedly requires more in terms of coordinated answers from a progressive left. The challenges, with right-wing populism and neoliberalism at the top of the list, can only be faced through broad alliances of citizens that have the capacity for strategic, political thinking and acting. In order to reclaim these courses, streets, parliaments and governments, civil society has to organize and push forward a radical and democratic change that highlights and focus on their commonalities rather than their differences. How can existing parties and grassroots networks cooperate in order to build capacity and gain political influence? What kind of challenges do social movements face when they work with parties? We are today at the summer school of the Activist Fora series in uh, Rijeka in Croatia. Uh, so today's topic is about uh, building networks of uh, power uh, inside and outside of institutions uh, and we're going to uh, take advantage that we have uh, three participants uh, here f uh, of the Fora uh, from the region to talk a little bit about this. Um, so the first thing is um, when talking about um, alliances between grassroots organizations or citizens and, um, and political parties. Last month on the local level we had the example of, uh, of the local elections in Zagreb, Croatia, with, um, with the citizens platform Zagreb Yenash, Zagreb is ours, who uh, uh, is, um, are citizens that made alliances with uh, uh, parties from the left uh, and, uh, and from the green movement uh, to actually uh, run for elections and they won four seats at the local council uh, which can be seen as, a, as an achievement uh, because it's not that often that uh, um, this kind of platforms actually win elections on the local level. So my first question to you uh, and maybe you can relate to other examples, there might be that we don't know, um, uh, do you need more of that in, in, the, in, in the region and uh, do you think it's like a, a, a good example of building alliances? Uh, so maybe yeah, we can start yeah. from the world. Okay, so I'm not from Croatia and I don't know that much detail on Zagreb and Ash, but uh, that's actually one of the initiatives that have been entering Parliament since the new left has slowly emerged during the 2000s. So in Slovenia we have the initiative called uh, Democratic Socialism, which entered the Parliament a few years ago and which act actively contributes to broadening a little bit this left-wing politics in the region and it's an uh, example that in Serbia is followed by this left-wing summit of Serbia and also Zagreb in Russia and Croatia. And I think the most, I think, uh, uh, important contribution of these uh, parties is that they all learn from each other and they're not simply uh, parliamentary oriented but in a sense come from movements that have been uh, initiated or have been reacting against neoliberal austerity polities from 2008 onwards after the crisis. So in a sense, I think uh, this, uh, um, this represents uh, a return of the Balkan uh, social, uh, social movements uh, in a way that's not at all similar to what we had in the 50s, the 60s uh, with the Communist Party, but an attempt to rebuild it because after uh, the fall of Yugoslavia, after its breakup, uh, socialism has been in a sense stigmated in the public discourse. And this is the first time that's came back in. Yeah, um, there's been, and there's been also, um, I would say, loosely ideological alliances as well across the region because we've seen um, authoritarian tendencies across the region. So there have been alliances that are against something or pro-reforms, but those reforms are not necessarily um, heavily ideologically formed. Um, and those are slippery slopes. But then um, as a side effect, not as the intended consequence, but as the unintended consequence, we've also seen parties that uh, get internally more democratic as a result of the, their interaction or their alliances with social movements, even when they are ideologically loose, let alone when they're not. 
Um, so that's something that, uh, of course, we need more of. Okay. If I'm okay, well, I agree with uh, what was said earlier, though I'm a little bit skeptical regarding the, the possibilities of implementing these grassroots movements into the left parties. I think that uh, one of the main problems with nowadays politics and with NGOs, including the grassroots movement, is actually a complete lack of ideology and complete lack of a system of political ideas. So they are reacting to certain problems in a society, and I think it's good, and I think they are actually identifying important problems in society, but unless they are not ready to put it into a system of ideas and a system of beliefs uh, that they will then strongly argue for. And uh, especially in Croatia, there, there have been other examples of this grassroots movement um, advocating for some form of direct democracy. Uh, one of them is, for example, Pravo Nagrad in Zagreb, uh, saying that uh, certain streets should not be made uh, into a parking uh, parking area, but should be left for people. Uh, then there is in Dubrovnik, uh, with uh, you know, on the hill about Dubrovnik, there is uh, there is an idea to put some elite tourism and golf terrains and so on. And the people said, no, we don't want to ruin that beautiful hill, and so on. But all these cases were actually reactions to certain problems made by political parties. And I'm afraid that uh, mostly in Croatia, the grassroots movements actually start as a reaction towards a problem and not as something that offers uh, cooperation, collaboration with political parties, apart from those on the right. Mm -hmm. And that's the problem. Okay. Yeah, that's an interesting insight. I mean, here um, in, um, with, uh, with Activist for a while, we, there is a trial to build a platform uh, where we could uh, develop policies and demands that could actually inspire, I mean, le progressive left forces uh, in, uh, in the region, actually both um, outside of um, the inst institutional uh, uh, sphere, but also uh, inside in a way, because there is this idea and there is some papers that have been written by participants about the relationships that they have to have with political parties. Um, and uh, you've mentioned a few challenges, but maybe because you've said different things, I mean, what do you think, um, uh, what, is, what do you think is the best strategy? What should we start in next? Should we first start to build networks of uh, uh, production of economic and social power first, and then to make sure that they have a, like a, a proper demands and, 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 you know, and very strong and very clear, and then try to influence political parties? Or do you think this, this should be in parallel and how uh, maybe, Elena, we can start with you. If you yeah, that's a, that's a tough question. And we've been, uh, in Macedonia, for instance, we've been having this discussion for a long time. Um, now that we have a new social democratic government, who in the past, I would say, actually, uh, as a result of the strong activist movement, um, has been moved to the left a lot. So if you, if you analyze the past um, election programs of, of the Social Democrats, the latest one, which came after all the different movements that we've had, uh, when we had a strong movement outside the party or not outside the institutions, they, we managed to pull them to the left in a way. At the same time, now they are in, involving certain activists who are also experts in their fields. It's not just because they're activists. Um, in the institutions. Okay. And I am skeptical because the moment you're in the, in the institution and you act as an individual, it's much easier, it, it's harder to, to resist. Uh, let's put it that way. So, so I think, but at the same time, you cannot change things unless you are there to, to influence them. So I think we need both. I don't think it's an either or. I think we need people in the institutions, but also strong social movements outside to hold them accountable. Basically, a lot of movements are anti-establishment in a sense, and I agree with this, yeah. But also you have the side of the establishment which cannot continue by itself. I mean, basically any sort of alternative policy would be more viable than what we have now. I mean, you can look at the labor laws throughout the region, which are uh, completely disintegrating social rights, uh, you know, legalizing precarious labor. This is not going to attract foreign direct investments, not going to solve anything. It just uh, increases social instability. It's dubious, I think, uh, the ways in which uh, we practice neoliberalism, I mean, in the governments which uh, practice neoliberalism, 
that they do this ritually, they do this habitually without any sort of um, institutional awareness of how their own institutions function. And in this sense, I think uh, that uh, the movements with these ideas that they do have, in a sense, have, I think, uh, still more viable alternative than the ones that are held by the government, basically. I mean, I don't say this because the, we should be optimistic in which these uh, in ways which these uh, movements are developing, but uh, this is actually the crucial point. It's process. It's not you know, a single issue or complex issue that these movements just put forward and it's there, so it's, it's done. There's no recipe. But in this sense, uh, something other, I think, emerges now in these recent movements. I mean, um, if you look at Zagreb in Ash, if you look at Nedayan in Belgrade, if you look at the Rog Factory in Slovenia, these are not uh, movements which just blatantly uh, go against institutions. They have put forward their own ways how the things should function. In Niš, there's also uh, the tenants' movements. Uh, in Kraljevo, the local initiative. In Novi Sad, the student movement. These are all the people that I think are not stupid. They're not, not like uh, without any sort of idea how how something should function. Uh, tomorrow, our system can function like this better, you know, if it was instituted in a way. And what I'm aiming at is a triangle between institution, governments, and movements. So this is something also that you can see uh, the European Union advocating, and I'm talking about the Berlin process, which is uh, uh, also a viable uh, thing that's happening in the Western Balkans. Basically, it's a pause in your integrations, and uh, one of the I think uh, issues that was raised during this process is uh, the per participatory dimension of social movements, grassroots movement in uh, uh, policy making, which uh, I think also can be dangerous, but it also does show a sign that you know a crack is already there. You know, so uh, the elites don't know where to lead basically now, and uh, all of these movements are in a process of creating different uh, alternatives. I mean, what we're doing now in Rijeka, policy papers, you know, discussing alternatives. It's not a single uh, event. I mean, you have all these events in the Balkans throughout different uh, you know, organizations, platforms. And the ones I mentioned, the Initiative for uh, Social Dem uh, Democratic Socialism in Slovenia, actually has a theoretical part. It's the Institute for Labor Studies, which is influencing the party in a sense. I mean, uh, most of us uh, in the social movements come from you know, philosophical, social backgrounds. This, this is, I think, not a coincidence in a way that uh, we're not simply you know, going in the streets waving our own red flags. It's uh, you know, making this happen for some reason as well. Oh, yeah, yeah, to continue on the, on, the, yeah. on the other question, well, I believe that there is an important distinction between grassroots levels, uh, grassroots movements at the local level and at the national level. And I think it's a completely different approach uh, towards problems that we are facing as political party or as the local administration. Because uh, at national level or even European level, uh, you have a High, highly, you know, strict division between ideas and uh, the policies that you want to affect influence a lot of people, and combine uh, they're combined and their values are conflicted. To try to construct uh, a system, because we don't have now a system. We have as left parties. We maybe have as party members, but people usually no longer think in political systems. They think in answers to certain problems and we want to create the system again that's the only way for the left to live again and of course the, the other thing is how can we resolve this problem at the local level I believe that at the local level uh, we can combine different political ideologies so we no longer uh, the initiative does not have to start from political parties it can start from local administration it can start from grassroots movements themselves uh, but it's it's a different level <coughs> a different level of discussion yeah yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, if you, uh, and it's, it's true, it's difficult also to have the, the time and the space, enfin, it's, it's a little bit of a luxury also to be able to create an alternative system. I mean, you need to have people that have the time to do it. Uh, you need to go in places, not only in capital cities, or not only uh, speak on the theoretical level, but it's important because it nourishes, you know, the practical um, uh, elements of politics. But um, but it's also interesting also what you said when, but, but towards the big challenges which are which can be neoliberalism or uh, then it becomes really difficult because this is a machinery that is very well oiled and very well networked. I mean the, the neoliberal movements uh, are very well networked and know of each other and have a system also on how to build power and uh, you know uh, and um, 
changing, you know, going to uh, other organizations' board or institutes and etc. to really make circulate this, uh, um, this this knowledge about and, and, and building power little by little, which is something that we miss a little bit also in uh, in more progressive, especially on the on the transnational level, on the European level, or maybe on the international level. We can speak, we can say, but what is interesting as well is. Um, um, to come back to your point mm -hmm. is how do you um, ground the policies that you're developing in uh, also people's realities? Uh, because it's true that um, sometimes um, it's difficult to, to make sure that all the different lived experiences of the people and their own you know, perceptions and then as as social movements, sometimes they are not completely diverse. I mean, sometimes they are a little bit more unified, or uh, sometimes they are more um, middle-class people in there. And so, so how do you? And, and, and but they are perfectly legitimate in their claims. The problem is that they are not always representative. So, how do you see this um, uh, in your own context? I mean, uh, how much do you think it can be a problem, especially when you know you come to power, and then all of a sudden, you know, the people that have build the platform with you, you know, are uh, expecting to be represented very well. Uh, Ivan, can, uh, Alexander, I can start, yeah. sorry. It's, yeah, okay. Uh, I don't think there's uh, this great line of divide between, you know, us sitting here, you know, talking these ideas, you know, and the reality being somewhere on the streets, you know. I mean, we're all equally exploited in a sense, uh, you know, uh, I mean, equally part of the same system. Because uh, the ideas that have been put forward by the new left uh, have been ideas that have not originated in academia, to be, honest, mm -hmm. to be perfectly clear. These are uh, the things that you will not hear in faculties, you know, in uh, different uh, high-level institutions uh, being developed for policy, policy making uh, decision alternatives. And uh, they are not part of a single elitist group of left-wing thinkers or whatever, but have been, in a sense, you know, crafted from different struggles. So the other thing is that uh, I think uh, what uh, divides us from the previous versions of the left is establishment employment, because the previous uh, liberal left could be employed in establishment, could have you know, had uh, a wide range of um, a public you know, publicity, media, you know, availability to go through institutions and do something. That's only, I think, at least and even in an optimistic way, it's maybe a beginning to happen only now in Serbia and or, or throughout the region. So in this sense, I think before you can put forward any sort of ideas into action, you have to have a wide range of background of coalition between you know different uh, social actors which can influence you know concrete policy. If you look at our relations with different different countries, if you look at the working class, the German working class lives in Serbia, Croatia, Slovenia. It's not the other way around. The guys that are working for foreign uh, 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 institutions and firms come from peripheral countries. It's called outsourcing and it's here. And it basically means that any sort of uh, stoppage within the periphery would affect the core as well. So uh, there's this you know, double bind between the core and the periphery, periphery, but this does not mean that, for example, the working class in Germany is any, you know, uh, in any privileged position within the Serbian working class. So it affects both classes in the center and the periphery, but that also tells you a lot of uh, where the potentials for any uh, activity of opposition go. Yeah. Yeah. I agree completely. And uh, I think the, the question might be, the right question might be not how to make sure that, this, uh, that uh, the demands of the grassroots movement um, reflect everyday struggles, but to kind of build a collective consciousness about that among those who struggle. Mm -hmm. um, to give you an example, I mean, you mentioned the foreign direct investments. In Macedonia, there have been so many times when people from the grassroots movement could go and try to talk to workers um, from, um, from these factories where the working conditions are really terrible. Um, in one of them, there's 150 women using three toilets and they can only go to the toilet. I'm, I'm giving you an example just to plastically explain how bad it is. They can only go to the toilet when there's a break for that. Um, so we go and talk to them and then on a personal level, on an atomized level, one by one, they do agree with you, but they don't want to organize themselves. They think they might lose their jobs, which is understandable. So the question then is, it's not so much of um, channeling the, channeling up, so to say, um, channeling up the demands, but it's also building up the, the, the equal level uh, in some ways. Um, <clears throat> that's one. And the second thing is, um, 
I think it's, it's an important question that the, that the left faces is how once um, a party is in power or a coalition is in power, um, they are obviously they, all, they have a different role to play than the one when they are candidate when they are running towards something. Mm -hmm. um, so when they try to balance out this, they are, uh, how, how do they balance out the role they play in a global, well in our case, peripheral, semi-peripheral um, um, area, um, and also how do they reflect the, the needs of those that um, that elected them? Um, and what happens then? Sometimes gov uh, governments, even when they are from the left, um, act a bit schizophrenically. Uh, to give you an example again from Macedonia, because this is very, it's happening now, so it's very, um, very recent and it's exciting. Um, so on the one hand, uh, th they say that they want to advance um, um, labor rights, uh, and I do believe them, and they've integrated people from the, the movements in doing so, but they also have, they say that we will continue this trend of attracting foreign direct investments the same way uh, which was before, which was through cheap labor. So how do you do both things, really? Um, and so here is, I think, those are both challenges. The way I see them is that the grassroots, the organized grassroots, grassroots movement um, has challenges facing horizontally, on expanding the or getting people on board with the struggles that they do face, but also vertically towards the whoever is in power, but particularly when we have someone who is willing to listen. I think that the same problem was in UK. Uh, I even read an article about uh, Tony Blair mm -hmm. having a meeting. Uh, with uh, representatives of trade unions saying that, oh no, his, his political ideas will completely protect the workers, uh, they will put strong uh, you know, bounds on the capital and uh, so on, and then having lunch, and then after lunch having another meeting with entrepreneurs, and then saying completely opposite in the same day, two hours later. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's really the problem of the Oh, uh, let's call it the, the, the third, you know, uh, the third way left. Uh, <clears throat> it's really a problem, but uh, let me just uh, put back that you're, you're mentioning neoliberal social movements and so on and so on in the beginning of your question. Well, I'm, I, I'm not sure whether there are neoliberal social movements. I think there are conservative social movements, there are socialist, social democrat social, uh, social movements, but I'm not familiar about neoliberal social movements. Uh, and I think that the reason is because Neoliberalism doesn't need social movements. Uh, neoliberal parties are founded and supported not by social movements, not by participation of citizens, but by the capital and uh, the, the, the wealthy. So I think that uh, social movements is the only thing that social democracy can count on. Because otherwise, either we can reject uh, the money from banks and from uh, huge companies, in that case, we'll be completely broke, or we can accept it. In that case, we won't be social democrats anymore, and we'll turn out to be neoliberal as well. So I believe that uh, social movements are actually may maybe one of the, maybe not only social movements, just citizens in general, are what social democracy has to count on in order to come in power and you know, in order to stay in power. Yeah, but, uh, can I follow? <laughs> I think one big challenge has been, uh, I, I completely agree, and I think one big challenge has been how to repoliticize what has been depoliticized. Yeah, no, because the public sphere has been completely depoliticized, which exactly is only neoliberalism or neoliberal powers that have to gain from. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that is the bigger challenge, how to, we have this, um, hyper-production of news, of daily news, that actually depoliticizes people quite a bit. And uh, an interesting, I, I found it very interesting, I was reading um, some studies on uh, Yugo nostalgia, on people being nostalgic for Yugoslavia, and they have found that um, it's not just the, the, the social state that they were nostalgic towards, which is understandable, but they were also nostalgic towards them having, people having sense of agency, having sense of control over their own lives. So I, I found it, well, interesting but also tragic that in a single party system people felt that they were more in control of their life mm -hmm. through different councils, um, um, neighborhood associations, whatnot, they were more in control of their life than they are nowadays with a multi-party system. Yeah. So it but speaks volumes yeah, about yeah. democracy. No, that's an interesting actually because we, we can feel with what, if I understood what mm -hmm. you said, that we are also in a, in a transitioning period where people are trying to re 
you know, to repoliticize themselves through, you know, these new forms of uh, uh, grassroots movements that we, that we like, like Rambi Nash, but also others yeah. uh, that you mentioned before. And so this is also very interesting, and um, this transition, uh, which is also the same when, when now, um, when people are also transitioning, when these platforms are also going into power, there is also a transition. And how do you deal with this as well? And so this is also the next challenge when you are repoliticized and finally have the feeling, okay, I can get into power, I can re-affect the decisions that are, you know, affecting me. Then uh, still, it's a question of you know dealing with this double standard when you say these big yeah. systems that are just pulling you, you know, towards. Uh, policies that you don't want, neoliberalism systems that are influencing you, uh, and um, trying to stay close to what you to this business. Um, yeah. So, no, just last uh, last round, uh, just to say what would be for you um, as part of the of the platform here, building building it up. Uh, what would be yeah, the next uh, the next step? Uh, um, what do you think? Uh, what what do you think should happen? Uh, so that so that the process is working or whatever. Uh, yeah, uh, building the institutional infrastructure for resistance. Basically, what you said about uh, neoliberal movements not existing, not, not only they don't exist, neoliberalism uh, exists actually by demobilizing the masses through precarious uh, contracts, through all these institutional pressures uh, from up above. And it's not only that it demobilizes the masses that are like presently here, it uh, involves a certain amount of uh, deep um, infrastructural change that has never been, uh, never happened since the 1920s, and that's what Gaspar uh, Miklos Tamas calls the reversal of universal citizenship. Basically, meaning that you can uh, not, not uh, now, now have any social, economic rights that are associated with you being a citizen of any single na nation state or being protected in any other way by simply existing, by simply being born here. And uh, in this sense, uh, austerity has not only influenced these generations, but you know the entire uh, you know setting in which uh, people would evolve in uh, the following years. And um, any sort of resistance would have to attack that. You know, in a sense of uh, rebuilding, you know, the union uh, infrastructure, unionizing precarious labor, connecting different uh, student movements, bodies, unions, uh, and any sort of resisting body with institutions, because this is not only functioning on the level of uh, simple, you know, dictate from I don't know some Brussels, some I don't know, or some any other institutions, but actually is connected in a way that you know, I mean, neoliberalism is an international thing. And it's not going to be well, bro broken down simply like that. So in this sense, we have to first build the conditions of resistance before going into the resistance itself. Yeah. Very shortly, Ivan, and then I give you the last word. Um, okay. So what I believe that social, that actually all leftist parties have to do is to find some kind of middle way, a middle ground between elitism and populism. Because what we see is that uh, left parties during the 90s, uh, during Tony Blair, during Bill Clinton, uh, Schroeder and so on, have turned out towards some form of an elitist, uh, uh, elitist management within political parties and elitist actually policies that were put out. Uh, on the other hand, the pure populism, I believe, is disastrous as well. And mostly because we can see that populism now in Europe is mostly or almost exclusively right-wing populism. But nonetheless, to take care that this message is a correct one, not just any message or just message that people would go out in the street and say, yeah, this is what we believe. We need to combine the academic expertise on the one hand and uh, to send the message, but also to create the message, not, on, not only to send it, to create it uh, in, co in coordination with the masses, with the citizens and so on. And also to, to, to wrap it up, we're constantly talking about what was the next left, what's new left, what kind of new left should we have for the 21st century and so on and so on. But it seems, and that's one of the things that we mentioned in the panel discussion on Sunday, that actually, I'm not sure what this, new left should look like. Maybe it's better to look back and see what the old left looked like and to try to bring it back because uh, it seems that this is what people want. If you look at uh, uh, what uh, Jeremy Corbyn does or what Bernie Sanders puts forward, these are actually extremely old leftist ideas. This is not something very new. It's the things how they were in the 60s or 50s. So I believe that's the correct the correct course for the next left to actually to go back and not to keep going forward. 
I think there's a, I think in that the new left, I think there should have been a coma between the new and the left. Because the new left in the sense not of ideas, but in the sense of against the status quo. And actually what you see across the globe, it's interesting, I think the first time in history we have a discussion anti-globalization in the core of those moving the, uh, the, the globalization, not at the periphery, in the core. So it's very interesting, it's interesting times to have these discussions, but across, uh, across Europe and in the US, you see this anti-status quo uh, voting. Trump is an anti-status quo mm -hmm. vote. Uh, Labor is anti, so the question is, who is going to offer the new, and then the left should be that. That's why the, when I when I talk about when they talk about new left, I think there's there there should have been a comma between mm -hmm. the new and the left. Uh, and absolutely, I think we have to draw on, especially in the post-Yugoslav space, we have ideas and we have legacies that, um, no matter how demonized they have been uh, in, in in recent decades, um, that are worth exploring. We talked about gender equality the other day, which was much more advanced during Yugoslavia yeah. than it, it is now. Um, so then what, what is the next challenge for, to go back to your uh, question, what is the next challenge? I mean, the, the, the next challenge is, I, th I, um, I like the fact that we have a, a platform to learn from different experiences because there's valuable experiences across the region that I, I would not have heard of or we would not have heard of because there are local struggles, but there are local and often successful struggles from which we can learn. But that, that's one, one thing that could happen in this or any other uh, platform. What do we do with, um, what do we do with, uh, how do we channel our message and in our, in, in this case, particular policy recommendations? Um, I think there's at least two levels to that. Uh, one is, in some countries now there's an opening. To, to uh, again, I speak from Macedonia, the Macedonian experience, where now there's an opening to actually go and present some of our, the policies that we have, the policy recommendations that we have. Um, in other cases, I think we'll have to continue building alliances one way or another, because the challenges are not national. They are reflected nationally, but the challenges are much wider, bigger. Um, what do we do in a very non-committal way? We'll keep talking, we'll keep thinking left, um, and hopefully we'll continue acting left as well. Okay, well, thank you very much for your different perspectives and we have a little bit of hints about how uh, different ways of how to build power in the next, so thank you very much and... Uh, thank you.